Alhamdulillah. Welcome to the, the, the Sira and grapp Grappling uh, course. My name is Muhammad Al-Marouk. I am from the Bay Area, but at 14 I went overseas. I, I went to Mauritania, West Africa. I lived out there for two years in the desert alone. And then uh, we can talk, we'll, we'll talk about that in the Halakha. And then I went to Jordan, I was there for five years. Then I was in Turkey for three years, and now I'm in, like, kind of settled in Canada. Come back and forth though, my family's here. It's my community, so alhamdulillah, I'm glad to be back. Thank you to MCC for hosting um, this, uh, this series. There was a, you know, a jiu-jitsu kind of program that happened um, a couple months ago. This is different because I've never seen a program that, that actually ties the sira with wrestling. I've seen, um, and then actually has uh, application. So I've seen a lot of like, we'll do a demonstration, you know, a couple throws in front of everyone to kind of see what grappling is. Um, but anyone who's actually grappled knows that it's very different than just a demonstration. It's a lot harder. So we're going to kind of, inshallah, be able to experience what the Sahaba felt a bit when they were practicing, when they were wrestling. Um, at, a, at a good pace, we're not going to do too hard. We don't have professional mats here, obviously. Um, we don't have... Um, you know, some of us might not have actually professionally wrestled before, so we want to avoid injury. We're not going to go, uh, you know, crazy, but we're going to definitely just feel it out, experience it, and then do some drills that will help you get a, a good understanding of the wrestling, the the experience. Not too much technique. I'm not going to, you know, do a whole class. So I teach you a couple moves and you practice them. It's going to be more. Uh, a natural uh, figuring it out kind of. So we're gonna we'll set you guys up with some good practices, and you'll go from there, inshallah. But we'll get there in a little bit. As an introduction, uh, I just wanna you know talk about the sig quick significance of wrestling. You know how it's c connected to the sunnah, how it's connected to our tradition. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Hu al baath al ummiin al rasulan yatlu alaihim ayati wa yuzakihim." Right. So he says, Allah, it was He who has sent amongst the unlettered Arabs, right, so the Arabs of that time, and all of us, a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them. So the key here is in purifying. That the Prophet was sent to purify people's character. He said, I was only sent right, to encourage, uh, to complete good character. Right? And what we're going to see is that in the seerah, a fundamental or a very significant part of purification is through physical struggle, right? It is through, uh, it, it, there's a physical aspect. So most of our, the talks we attend, it's all the spiritual, it's all the intellectual, right? This is how you're supposed to be a good Muslim. Think about patience, think about this, you know, think about ide like some a abstract concepts. Maybe they're, a bit, you know, applicable. Um, but the Muslim is a triad, which means there are three aspects to, the mu to, to every human being, to the Muslim as well in particular. And that is the physical, right? The first and foremost, the physical aspect. Then there's the intellectual aspect, right? And then there's the spiritual aspect. The physical is you know, how we worship Allah outwardly, but also we're going to see as is grappling. We have the intellectual, which is what we know about Allah, what we believe, our tenets of faith. Right? So why do you actually, I mean, if we did like a, a, a course on Aqidah, why do you believe Allah? Like what, what are your justifications to believing in God? Right? These are rational questions. Right? You're not going to grapple and find that out. <laughs> Right? Maybe you would. Right? He 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 figured that out. And then there's the spiritual um, element, right? The spiritual element that ties it all together, right? That draws us closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So the goal of the Muslim is to harmonize the physical and the intellectual aspects with the spiritual aspect. I we use the, in, the the intellectual and the physical to cultivate the spiritual aspect, the spiritual connection, which is the whole point. The whole point of our existence is to worship Allah, to know Allah. Allah says that that was the only reason why He created us in the first place, was to worship Him, to know Him. That's a spiritual thing. So if, if we're not using our physical, uh, you know, our body, we're not using our intellect to gain clo get, get closer to Allah, there's something fundamentally wrong with who we are. Right? So as I mentioned, everything, welcome, welcome, is... Uh, you know, there's a huge emphasis on the intellect, right, and, and learning and taking courses. Today, we're going to understand how the Sahaba physically 
right, encourage their spirit, that spiritual aspect, how they physically draw, you know, drew closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something which is very lost in our, in our tradition, right? We become a very sedentary tradition uh, or people. And um, actually recently, it was scientifically diagnosed, sedentary, is, sedentary just means not moving, right? not creating motion, that is actually considered a disease state, right, uh, medically. That just being like sedentary, not working out or having some kind of activity in everyone's, in everyone's life is actually considered a disease state, not like a natural, a normal state. It's a disease state, which means that there are problems that are, you know, waiting to occur, waiting to happen if you're not active, right? You're not moving. So it, it aligns with how the, the Prophet lived our life. And in particular, in this day and age, when we don't have really, you know, uh, physically demanding lives, you know, we're not farmers as they were in the past we're not going to war right we're not you know carrying heavy things building mosques right none of us have probably ever done something like that in our lives um, then it's very important that we, we we introduce this aspect because a lot of the movement that the sahaba and the prophet had was natural it's just through the the lifestyles that they lived right and then additionally they added wrestling additionally they added training for war and whatnot, right? So in this time and age when most of us, you know, will sit, spend a whole day in the house, you know, not in the sun, no activity, very, very important, especially for men and building men's testosterone uh, because testosterone uh, is a hormone that leads uh, primarily to motivation. It leads to uh, a dr the, the drive that men need to then go in the past, conquer, you know, villages and, and, and fight wars to be motivated to get things done Right, to have confidence, right? That's all connected to testosterone, right? So, um, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he says that the dhirwa to sanam, right, the pinnacle of one's faith is jihad, right? Now, jihad literally means a physical struggle, right? It's not just fighting in war. It means a physical, a, it could be emotional, it could be intellectual, spiritual, but it's a physical struggle, right? So, that's the, the height of a Muslim's reality is struggle, it's difficulty, it's putting themselves in difficult situations and getting better through those situations. And we'll see this like, you know, there's a whole new movement of like, you know, stay hard and you know, you might have these influencers talking. They're all tapping into this understanding that Sahaba knew really well, which is that when the human being is in very difficult and trying situations, he adapts and he learns from that and he finds a new part of his mind, his, a new part of his ability that he didn't know existed before. Right? This is all part of like, this is what all those you know, influencers are talking about, right? That aspect of finding that, that next level ability that we all have that, that's not, that doesn't come out in just living a comfortable life, that doesn't come out in just taking it easy. It comes out through difficulty, right? So the Prophet saw something he said as well, he said, every single thing, كُلُّ مَا يَلْهُ بِهِ الْمَرْءُ Al Muslim Batal. Everything that distracts a Muslim is falsehood. Every distraction for a Muslim is falsehood. A Muslim isn't basically saying a Muslim doesn't get distracted. This is kind of like, you know, we'll talk about this in the halqa a bit, like the, the, the harm of our of, of of these devices. You know, like we, we need it to live our lives, right? But we have to be very cautious because although there's so much benefit that we can gain from it, they are fundamental distractions. Right, they're fundamental distractions. Any of us can know that. Just you look at your like digital well-being, you'll see how many hours we spend on our phones, right? And it depends. Some people are really good at it. Some people aren't. But everyone has experienced distraction, right? And an an unhealthy distraction as well. So the Prophet he says that Muslims are not distracted. But there are exceptions to this. There are exceptions to the general understanding of. Lahu that we hear. Lahu means like a distraction, right? They usually say like, oh, you know, don't do lahu, that's a waste of time, right? So there are distractions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, he says, If we intended to take a diversion, right, something that distracts, we could have taken it from what is with us, right? If indeed we were to do so, i.e. from what is important to us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that there are divine or you could say godly distractions, quote unquote, I mean, we see distractions. And this is the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to purify our soul, right? It's not pure worship. You're not, you know, just praying, you're not just doing dhikr, right? But you are distracted with something that's still drawing you closer to Allah, right? And this is 
what we call the prophetic sports, right? The prophetic sports. Um, and the prophetic sports are archery, grappling, horseback riding, right? And swimming. These are the four prophetic sports. He did more, but these are like the four well-known prophetic sports the Apostle Sam did. And Imam Ghazali actually mentions that there are four aspects to the human reality that, that, that everyone deals with. You have um, your intelligence, as we mentioned, your anger, right? Kind of this drive. You have your nafs, yourself, right? You're like, and then you have your ego, and you have your balance, and, and then you have the aspect of 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 adil, of balance that one has in their life. And it's these prophetic uh, sports that actually cultivate each one of these um, aspects of the human reality, right? It's like it's through these prophetic sports that we cultivate those reality is that one incomplete balance and one perfected produce someone who is uh, like, the, you could, like the perfect human being, right? The one who is constantly in elevation towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we look at archery, right, has anyone done archery? Right, people, nice, mashallah. Right, so if anyone's tried archery, um, this is used uh, to sharpen the intellect, right? It's used to sharpen the intellect and, and one's focus. Right? Imam Shafi'i, you know, the great jurist and person of the, the Shafi'i Madhab, he was a renowned archer. They said he, was, he used to be so good at archery that he would draw his name in, in arrows. I, he would hit and draw his name on the target. Right? That's how uh, skilled he was as an archer. Right? And, so, and he obviously, you know, Master, you know, looking at the intellect of someone who is, you know, he had photographic memory, right? He, majority of his entire life, right? And his accomplishments in basically founding this Shafi'i Madhab, which so much of the so many people of the world, right, follow, right? So the reason why is because when you are doing archery, you're harnessing that power, right? That you're pulling back your power, and then you are delivering, right, an effort towards a very precise uh, point, right? You're trying to hit the bullseye. Very precise, right? And you start from slow distances, right? You, and as children, right, you know, you give them small, under, easy things to understand. They learn basic words, right? And as we get older, and then more intelligent we get, we attack, we attack stronger and more difficult problems. It's like in school, you you build your intellect. The idea is that the human being is constantly, you know, aiming towards a target intellectually. They're using their entire intellectual case uh, capacity and then they're trying to reach that, that goal and then when you miss you miss the target right you then you right make adjustments right and you try again and you try again and you try again and you do this so consistently until that process becomes uh, natural you start to hit the target consistently right that's the same thing with with like with any intellect or any kind of mental problem right you're constantly trying to figure out the solution and then through that trial and error and constantly getting closer, it just clicks. This is kind of like the understood of like, of like math, is that when they came up with these f formulas, it's like it's working, it's not working, not working, getting close, and then it clicks, and it just and it works, right? It's that, it's that understanding that they have that then allows them to create a formula that works or um, um, like a processes or a uh, solution that works for multiple different instances, right? In, in math, so the, you know, archery is a is a sport of patience, of perseverance, of consistency. Grappling, which we're going to learn about today, right? This is what we use to control our anger, right? Like in terms of the human, there's a lot more benefits we're going to talk about for grappling. But the the fundamental thing is that it controls the anger. I don't mean anger in you know the sense you get really you know like you get angry because someone annoyed you. I'm talking about anger in the sense of that, that drive, right? The, 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 the force that people have to get things done, right? When someone's basically fighting, you know, running away from a, like a, you know, a predator, right? Or someone who's trying to kill them or someone, you know, is failing and failing and failing. And then it has that, that anger to then want to fix where they're at, to change their situation, right? That drive to uh, take, you know, wh whatever problems we are dealing with right now, and then evolve, right? That takes that will, that drive, right? So it's not just like the linguistic meaning of, of anger, right? And the reason why is because grappling right, is a struggle with oneself, right? It humbles, as we're going to see today, it humbles individuals. Everyone who, uh, you know, has grappled, 
is 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 uh, is humbled, and they might then you know as they get better you know gain back their ego right. It's problematic, but fundamentally, everyone who like shows up at the gym the first time gets humbled, right? There's no way around it. If you show up to a gym and you're not humbled, it's a bad gym, right? If you show up to the gym and you're and you're like taking and you know, you're showing off first time. It's a, probably a really bad gym, right? The best quality gyms are the ones that you come in, you get wiped. The floor is, you know, you, you know, you're just a test dummy, right? And then you get better and better, and it builds that confidence, right? Um, so it 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 breaks away any anyone's like uh, overextending anger, right? If someone has you know, lacks control with their family, with others around them, they can't control their anger. Grappling is a, is a way to build that control, right? Because you put all of this drive and this anger towards your opponent into very speci- uh, precise movements, right? Into control, into, into you know, moving precisely and, 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 and methodically. You're not just going out there yelling and just trying to do whatever you can. Right, you're you're following technique, right? And the, and the people who follow technique are usually better. If you see any, you know, a fight and the guy is just kind of wailing a lot of times, you know, you know the other person steps back and then hits him with a direct strike and it's done, right? So it's there's you know it take it, it takes these people who are rough around the edges or have maybe anger problems or you know um, a trouble with their humility and then it allows them through training. You have to you have to you know honor your training apart you know partner. Anyone who's wrestled, you get a partner who like is trying to go 100% all the time. It's horrible, right? <laughs> because he's missing the whole point, right? The whole point is to get better and to learn from your mistakes. If someone's going all out, right, he might injure. He might injure himself. He might injure the opponent. But he's but he, that that person that he's training with isn't the opponent. He's there to help you get better. He's there to learn from, right? So it takes control, right? And you see people like. Either the people who who did that, who like who are like that and are kind of trained like that, they're considered like the like the class like the class jerks, right? People don't want to people don't want to train with them because they don't have control, right? They don't understand where to use that anger, where to use that force, that strength, right? They're just just opening, you know, just unleashing every time, right? And then end up, you know, it doesn't allow them to to uh, to be conducive to the environment, right? In every environment, we want to create people who are uh, we'll talk about this too. Like dangerous, they have power, right? But they know exactly where to place it, right? When they're on the mat, going against their opponent, against the enemy in war, they know they know how to push and put that anger to use. When they go home, though, right? They, you know, they don't use their anger on their wife, right? On their children, right? They're balanced, right? So it's about balance, balancing that control, that power that men have, right? And sometimes over people who don't, right? The men, like the power a man has right, in strength over a woman and whatnot, that takes control. It's a responsibility, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with that power to use it to protect them, right? Not to abuse them, right? So that this all comes from right, channeling one's anger through grappling, right? And it encourages self-analysis, right? Anyone who, and we're going to see this in the seal, anyone who wrestles and then just tries to run back into it, right, and then just runs back into it, they don't get good, right? And you see some people like this when they train, right? Um, they don't really progress, you know, they, they're at the same level for a very long time, right? They get the honorary next belt, right? It's just been too long, right? They're just in the gym too long. I mean, it's about time, right? But the people who actually analyze what they do and they find, you know, man, I, okay, what did I do there? I did this and I got wiped, I did this. He he turned. He he adjusted, and he did. That. Okay, how do I how do I maneuver differently? How do I switch my game plan, right? And they said that like for example in jujitsu, I've trained. So I've trained like you know grappling and jujitsu for over ten years now. So you know in uh, in in jujitsu for example, they say that you know uh, white belt you're just getting is destroyed, right? Blue belt you learn the bulk of your of your of your technique. Purple belt you start to think. Like at purple belt, you start to like actually think about your emotions. All right, I know this technique, but what's not working? Why am I not? And you kind of find your own style. In brown belt, you hone that style and you get better. And then black belt's just uh, you know is kind of the fine the fine tuning, right? So purple belt's kind of the last stage where you kind of complete your you actually complete your knowledge of of jujitsu. The the other two belts are there just kind of refining it and making it better and better and better. So when you leave as a black belt, you have your your you know you're very on top of your game. You know exactly what works for you, 
right? Very rare you'll have a, you know, I mean, they, they dedicate their entire life, but you have someone who's just good at everything. Very rare, right? That, that is usually like very small superstars who give their whole life, right? Most people, they have a game, they have a certain technique, a takedown that they like, that really works for them, and they get good at it, right? You, you know, you can't, you know, jack of all trades is a master of none, right? That's kind of well understood for majority of people, right? Um, so, um, in that as well, you know, it, it's gonna we're gonna see how it increases, you know, mental, you know, getting through mental obstacles as well, grit, perseverance, right? You can't, you know, if you're in the middle of a fight, you can't just give up, right, and just turn over, right? You, you know, if you're if you're in the middle of a wrestling match, you can't just, you know, give up, even though you're, you know, you're getting a cramp, you're gassing out, you have to keep going, right? So, uh, in a real life situation, you can't just give up, you can't just, you know, just you know, just just resign yourself to your fate, right? You have to you have to try your best, right? So this is what grappling it teaches you. And in other situations, we usually just have the easy opportunity just to kind of tap out. You know, you just kind of if you, you don't want to keep reading, you just stop reading. Grappling is not so easy, right? You don't want to you know you you don't want to stop. You get slammed on the floor. You know, you kind of just you stop paying attention, right? Um, you lose the tournament, right? That you paid money to get into, right? You get embarrassed, right? You get ch choked out, right? No one wants to get choked out, right? So these are all things that we learn from grappling at a very basic, fundamental level, right? Um, the nafs, one's ego, one's like desires, inner desires, lowly desires. This is controlled through riding horses. Right? They, they said that the horse is actually very similar to the human being, the human self, in its temperament, in its manners, and the way you actually will train and rein a horse. Is the same way you would train and you know rein a nuts, right? As you, you know, the idea is you're not you're not forcing it into a box. You're not like controlling yourself. You know, Imam Bulsidi said in the Buddha, he says that if you, you know, you know, push away your desires, but if you go too hard, it'll break. You'll break your nuts and it'll it'll rebound. And anyone who sees this, you see people who do like these challenges, you know, like a like a, a diet challenge. What happens, right? They go hard for two weeks, three weeks, and then they break and they go crazy on the opposite way. Right, because they were just doing they were, they were they were attacking it too hard. It was too intense, right? And they completely go the opposite side and just you know eat stuff that they weren't they never ate, right? Same thing for like any other desire and, and struggle people are going through, right? It takes time. It takes it takes uh, reining it. Just like when you you know you're dealing with the horse. If you try and and I I did horseback riding in Mauritania. If you hold down too hard, the horse is gonna buck and go crazy. It doesn't want you to control it and try and rip its head down, right? You do that, it's gonna say, "Wait a minute, I'm stronger." It's gonna go, it's gonna buck you, throw you again onto the wall. You get very hurt, right? But you also can't just let it go wild, right? It wants to be, it wants to be trained, right? So you still have to hold it. It starts veering off to the side. You pull, you pull it in, right? You 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 adjust it, right? You show that there's presence there. Right? They said when you when you ride a horse, you actually keep your legs tight. Tight on the horse, right? You're kind of squeezing with your with your uh, quads or your thighs, right? Because it shows that presence, that uh, con that constant presence that you're there with it. If you just kind of like let your legs fling, it'll just think, oh, there's no one on me. I'm just going to go crazy, right? So in the same way, on top of your life, on top of your desires, when you want to, or when people want to be lazy and whatnot, you have to constantly be in control. You have to constantly be in control and not let yourself break character, not like. Not let yourself do things that you know you shouldn't be doing. Not let yourself be, you know, disappoint yourself. Do something that you know you're going to regret in any way, whether it's religiously, emotionally, whatever it may be, um, right? But you also can't go too hard, right? You can't stay up all night. You can't push yourself too too hard because then you're going to break and you're going to go and you're going to reg regress and you're not going to actually improve, right? So. Um, this is taught in, in you know, horseback riding. You see people who like do a lot of horseback riding. They have a good understanding of their nafs and how to how to push yourself and, and and keep going, but not go too far, right? And how to constantly stay in control, constantly be aware, right? Your Muslims should never be in a situation where they're in out of control. We talk about like always being in control of the situation. Right, being aware of your surroundings. This is something that you know you learn from wrestling, you learn from martial arts, but it's something which everyone everyone has to know, right? To not be, you know, to, uh, because uh, you know there are like, you know, in, even in safe places like San Ramon and these places that are generally safe, there are things that happen, right? People, you know, like you know, people are attacked. There, are, you know, like horrible pranks that are thrown on people, like the knockout prank where they, they'll try and like these people, they'll try and like you know basically blindsight someone and just knock them out. 
a, one, a random person, right, in one punch, right? It's, I mean, they go to his battery, you go to jail if you do that, right? But it's, it happens, right? So the, the awareness that one has is very important, right, for themselves, for their family, right? Um, and this is what the Arabs at that time, they knew very well, right? Because if they weren't aware in their situation, they died, right? Their families were attacked, you know, they, they got into their families, right? So there's this awareness we see with the Sahaba that is, is key, um, and the final aspect, just the balance that one has throughout all of these, that's learned through swimming, right? So if you ever swam, you have to be very balanced, right? If you have one stroke's too, too strong, your whole thing starts to go, you, you start to get, you know, lopsided. Your right stroke, even if your, your right arm is more dominant, your right, your right stroke cannot be stronger than your left stroke, right? Because what happens if you if you uh, if if it's if it's too strong, right? You, there's there's an unbalance that'll happen. You're not going to swim straight, right? It's kind of like canoeing, right? Same thing with kicking, right? You have to it has to be equal speed. It has to be a consistent speed. Right? Otherwise, you lose speed. You lose momentum, right? So, you know, um, this 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 is learned this balance between these three between you know controlling your nafs, your your anger your mind, right, when to use which one, when to know how to, you know, when to, when to use your intellect, when to use that anger, when to use the aspect of, uh, you know, to, 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 to actually let your, your nafs have a break, right, to give yourself a break, to give yourself a rest, to, to work harder next. This is, this is something that people, you know, learn, because without balance, you end up on a really jacked up schedule, right, you can't, I, I mean, I remember, like, I read a book about, you know, like the like the greatness of the past, and when I was talking about like the lack of sleep that they had and how they wouldn't sleep, and some of it were like miracles, you know, people would just not sleep. So I tried that kind of intense not sleeping schedule. I actually ended up really getting sick. I got very sick, right? Because the body needs a balance, right? You can be all, I'm gonna be, you know, stay hard. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go crazy. I'm gonna just, you know, stay up all night. And then it'll catch up with you, right? You can. You're only going to be able to do that for a couple, maybe a week, two weeks. Then you're going to get sick, right? So the body needs a balance, right? Your nutrition needs a balance, right? Um, your workouts need balance, right? If you overtrain, you're going to mess yourself up for the next day, right? There's no point in overtraining when you're not when you want to be consistent. Uh, for example, I'm you know, I'm right now training for a marathon in January. Right, that's gonna, you know, in order to train the program, it's very consistent, and there's a lot of rest days, right? But if I don't take, and it's important that I take those rest days, even if I feel fine, because if you overtrain, oh, I feel fine today, I'm all good, right? You go run out into another couple miles, you come back the next week, they say, oh, now you got a 10 mile run, right? And now your sore, your 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 you know your calves are sore. Right, your ankles are, are swelling, and now you have to go do that 10 mile run. When that scheduled day break was there specifically for you, right, to recover for that next big test, that next big mile, that next big, uh, that next big attack, right? So you can run your body into the ground, be my guest, right? But the way for longevity, uh, longevity and increased progress and increased uh, g getting better, this is through balance, right? And this is learned through through swimming. This is like, well, I know it's not only learned through swimming. You can learn this through in you know a bunch of different ways, right? We're talking about the prophetic sports, right? The prophetic sports that right encourage uh, that teach us these things, right? So, but you can learn balance in other in other approaches, right? It doesn't have to be. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't only come from swimming, right? So some of the moral lessons we learn of grappling, and we're going to get, inshallah, right into this, um, uh, the, the grappling very soon, is, you know, uh, you know, it's one of the, the most neglected sunnahs, right? It's a sunnah, there's reward in doing it, and it's so neglected by so many people. So inshallah, the goal of this course is to right, reignite that sunnah, reignite that uh, that connection to the way the Prophet lived, right? Because in every single thing the Prophet did, there is benefit in that. Every single thing. Right? We don't. We actually don't get to pick and choose like what of the Sunnah we want to follow, right? You should follow all of it because that's the perfect example of how to live, right? A life, a productive life, a good life, a moral life, a life that's you know, centered on Allah. That's that's going. That's moving in the right progress, in the right direction, right? So. Um, right, it's um, it, you know wrestling as we're gonna see. It's very key to self defense. It's actually better than jujitsu in this sense, right? So jujitsu is good, like if you get put on your back, how to kind of maneuver and get out of that situation. But in reality, in real life situations, you don't want to be hanging out on your back. 
and there's a lot of uh, you know um, there's a lot of jujitsu which is pure sport. Like people pull guard. Mm -hmm. Like you walk up and you sit on the floor. In a real life situation, that's an, you're a big. You're asking someone to come and stomp you on the head from behind. You're asking someone to come, you know, rain down elbows and punches, right? While you're looking for a footlock, right? Very different. So there are aspects of jujitsu that are definitely beneficial. I did jujitsu. I'm a purple belt, getting a brown belt soon. I've done it for 10 years. I'm not a hater on jujitsu, right? That's the point of saying that is just like I'm not. I'm not someone uneducated about jujitsu, but but grappling is way more is way better for self defense, right? And you can end fights very quickly with grappling, because the ability to change levels, right? Drop down very quickly to avoid strikes. When people like get up and they're trying to fight, if you drop levels, they're not, not now they're no longer in that distance and you're underneath them. Right? The ability to maneuver very quickly and get behind them, right? It's all bad from there, right? You can pick them up and slam them on the floor. That fight's done, right? One good throw, even on mats, I've seen people tap out from a throw on a mat. It's like a squishy mat. It's not like carpet. It's a squishy mat, like professional meant for throwing. They get dropped and there's they lose all the air in their in their stomach and they're just keeled over, right? That fight's gone. That's done. Right? The person can do whatever he wants down to that person. Right? No, he's not, no one's gonna stop him. Right? So it's it's very like, practical, it's very useful, right? And with a blend of striking, some level of striking boxing, you have the perfect athlete. And this is why you have like um, you know, Khabib and these these wrestlers who dominate because right, their striking is okay, but their wrestling is so dominant, right? So dominant. I mean, Islam's a bit better, right? Uh, they're so dominant in wrestling that these elite strikers, right, are getting mauled, right, destroyed, right, and losing fights, right, losing fights. So, and they're they're elite people. So imagine people who don't know how to you know fight. Imagine someone who you're not even worried about his striking because he's not a striker, right? With that wrestling ability, which is not not hard, you can learn it very quickly, right? It's going to protect you. We're going to see examples of this where it came into the, the Sahaba's lives and they used it to actually protect themselves from um, uh, from from danger, actually, right? So it encourages, it, it builds confidence, right? When when someone knows that they can sweep someone or throw them, that builds confidence, right? When you don't know what a situation is going to turn out like, you don't, you can't, how can you have confidence? Right? If I go into a fight right now and I don't have any skills, how, I count, how can I be confident that I'm going to be the one walking away? It's a pure wild card. But if I know that I know how to get close to this person, I know how to, if I get it to the ground, choke him out very quickly. I know how to break his arm. I know how to sweep him. I know how to get behind him. I know how to block that's confidence, right? You know, you're, you're going to be able to perform better, right? And a lot of times fights go simply down to confidence. It's it, a lot of times it goes straight down to like the, the, the person, like the, the way someone thinks they, they, how the, you know, like the, their self image, like the way that they look at themselves, they think they personally just think that they're really good and they win because that confidence just makes them just work harder, right? Than someone who's kind of doubting their ability, right? It teaches humility, as we mentioned, patience, Resolving those problems take take patience. Sometimes, you know, like I I go at again, you know, you know, I'd go into training, and then the whole next day I'd be thinking about like what I did wrong, and the different solutions and how to work on that. Right? It's like you're a mad scientist, just is just eating you alive because that last session, you got wiped. The, the mats were wiped with you, and you're just you can't take it. Right? Everyone should have you should have that ego that that ego that makes you want to get better. Right? Everyone should have enough ego that when they get in, you know, when they get you know, thrown on the floor in front of everyone, it bothers them. If one gets, if someone gets destroyed and they're to and it doesn't mean and like they don't feel anything about that, it's a very, it's a weak person, right? They don't have, they don't have a strong uh, personality, right? There's a bit of like um, coward, cowardness there, right? Because any strong man should not want to be disgraced in front of people. They should not want to be, you know, asserted someone else's dominance over them, right? In front of other people, that should bother them, right? That should make you want to get better, right? So that's what it teaches you. Alhamdulillah. So, any questions about um, this introduction before we begin? Um, a quick s story. So, the way we're going to do this is we're going to I'm going to mention a story that actually happened in the sirah, and then we're going to like act it not act it out, but we're going to do uh, exercises that will help us understand it more. And we're going to come back and we're going to have a discussion. So I'm not going to be up here. We're going to have a, then a discussion about what went right, what went wrong, right, what we learned, and then. 
anything else, you know, anything else that you have, any, any other questions, any problems you had during it, um, inshallah. So, any questions? Okay, alhamdulillah. So it's na narrated by Bayhaqi. He mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, um, was once in the field, in this in this like uh, field, tending to sheep with Rukana. Rukana was the world champion wrestler of the Arabs at that time. He had never lost uh, a single uh, fight. Um, he never lost a wrestling match. Right? He was well known and revered and feared by the, by his own tribe and his people. The Prophet was sitting with him, tending to sheep, and the the sheep belonged to Abu Talib. And the Prophet he said, uh, "Do you want to wrestle me? Right? Do you want to wrestle?" Which meant that the Prophet had wrestled before. He knew how to wrestle. Right? You're not going to challenge someone to wrestle if you've never wrestled before. They knew it was something that they did. They grew up doing. So Rukana said, "You like." Who are you? Kind of, you know, like because he's the champion. It's like I don't, I don't know who you are. The Prophet he said, "Yes." He said, "For what? I we're gonna wrestle. There's stakes involved." Because he was so confident. So he, when he's so confident, he's saying, "Okay, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make some money today, right? Because I'm gonna win, and I'm gonna take this guy's sheep." Right? So the Prophet he said, "For a sheep." All right, so for a sheep. Um, so the Prophet so they said, "Okay." They agreed. They stood up. Right? And people are there, that's who narrate the story. They stood up, they wrestled, and the Prophet very quickly threw him. Right? He, he got him, we're going to practice some of those throws, and he threw him down to the floor. Now, we don't have a video of the Prophet doing this, but we have narrations that give us an idea of how they would have done this. Rukana was shocked. How did that happen? Right? He said, no, 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 let's go again. He gave him the sheep. He said, let's go again. Right? So Rukana gave him a sheep. Right? They go again, the Prophet throws him again. Right and pins him. We're gonna look at pins, right? The Prophet you know, he gives the Prophet another sheep, right? The Prophet said, "You want to go again?" He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go one one more time, right?" They go start wrestling. The Prophet slams him again and pins him, and he you know reluctantly hands over that last that that third sheep. A sheep were like you know right now a sheep is probably like you know two hundred three hundred dollars, right? So it's it's good it was it was good money back then, right? It was considered you know uh, very valuable. Right, so uh, when he when he when he fell down, he started looking around. <laughs> he was all looking all over the place. Rukana, and the Prophet said, "What's the matter?" And Rukana said, "I don't want any of the other herders to see me. Right, I don't want any of those to hear see me because, right, I was the strongest of them. I was the most feared of them, and I just got destroyed. Right, so I don't, you know, if they if I if they know that I was just got wrecked." They might start, you know, get some different ideas, right? They might challenge me or whatnot, right? He doesn't want to lose his position, right? So the Prophet he said, um, you know, do you want to go again? Do you want to go for a fourth time? And he said, uh, no, I don't want to go for a fourth time, right? I don't, I'm done. And he sat there like pretty depressed. He looked right like in sorrow. And the Prophet he said, you know what's going what, what's going on? He said, "I'm going to go to Abd Yazid, who is his father. I have to return to Abd Yazid with three, le you know, three less sheep." Saying, "I have to," I basically gave away three of his sheep, right? Which is like, you know, he's going, you know, who knows what his father is going to do? You know, be very angry with him. And he said, "And because I used to think I was the strongest man, I was so undefeated, right? Um, right? So um, the process of him, he said, as for the sheep, don't worry about it." Right, and he gave him back his sheep. This shows like the prophetic character. He gave him back the sheep that he had uh, taken away. Um, and then he, uh, in another narration, told him about his 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 you know message and 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 what he believed in. In another narration, he said he called, the Prophet called out to Rukana and said, "If I beat you in wrestling, will you become Muslim?" And Rukana said, "Yes," because that's how much confidence he had that if you beat me in wrestling, it's a miracle. Right, basically, right. Um, and soon after this, Rukana then became came back and, and actually became Muslim. Right? He came back and became Muslim, and um, and he he mentions later on. He says that I knew that he was a true messenger because right there was a different feeling right with him. Uh, you know, I knew that there was another power with him when he wrestled. Right? There's no way that me being the champion gets ragged all that easily. And even I mean, and that's not just ego. That's through trial and tribulation, right? You're, you know, through trial, not tribulation. You know, you're, you're, you're the champion wrestler. You beat everyone, and you get th wiped on the floor by someone who's not even a known wrestler, right? There's, that's a miracle, right? And he re he recognized that the Prophet was a prophet because of that miracle. It's one of the like the miracles we don't hear a lot about, right? The Prophet he beat Rokana, right? So, 
Um, what we learned from this is it was very common practice in the, in the Arabs to wrestle and to challenge each other in wrestling. Otherwise, you know, because you know they were just sitting with their sheep and they started wrestling. The Prophet you know, you don't challenge someone if, as we mentioned, you, if you don't know how to wrestle. The Prophet clearly knew how to wrestle, right? And we also see the IQ of Rukana, right? Because he kept going back, right, for more. He wanted to see how the the Prophet threw him. Right? No one just, any good wrestler is not going to get thrown and then just walk away. They want to see, what did he do? What move did he use on me? Right? How can I learn from this? How can I get better? And that's why he went back um, three, uh, three times. Right? So you don't, you don't beat the, you know, the champion without having uh, a good understanding of wrestling. We, from the, uh, the narrations, we can kind of see that the way that they wrestled was more Greco-Roman. So there's freestyle, there's two types of wrestling, freestyle and Greco-Roman. Freestyle is more of a, like a, a natural open uh, approach to it, right? There's, uh, you know, a lot more, uh, you know, different movements and uh, approaches to, to, the, to the wrestling. You really get low, right? There's double leg, there's a lot of different throws that involve getting close to the, to the ground, right? Greco-Roman roaming is very upright, right? You're not shooting down, you're not really changing levels. And a lot of times it's done through, through position, right? So it's very positional. And actually, in Mauritania, they had we used to wrestle, and they had this kind of wrestling where you'd kind of get in a position, and you try and throw each other from that position. That's kind of the idea. So that was the type of wrestling that um, the process they, they used to they used to do. And we're going to look at it today from a Greco-Roman uh, perspective. We're not going to look at freestyling today. There's too much to go through. It's mostly going to be Gre Greco-Roman, inshallah. So, um, uh, inshallah, we'll end the recording here, inshallah. Um, and let's first um, clear up the uh, uh, the chairs, and then we're gonna start practicing. Bismillah.